Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Greer from the Hello Work newsletter, and I'm so pleased to have with us Kay Hogan. Uh, so if you don't know Kay, she is a certified Hello Worker, an Alexander teacher, and a natural vision educator. She has a master's degree in education and counseling and specializes in codependency and addictions recovery. She has multifaceted training in various forms of massage, including shiatsu and foot reflexology. She's also studied tai chi, neurokinesiology, early developmental reflexes and movement, the DART procedures, natural vision re-education, and brain gym, which we will talk about. She has linked movement with the brain and the senses, in particular to vision, and has created her own style of work called the vestibular sensing system. And she has so graciously given me a sneak peek to her upcoming book, Upright, Changing Our Thinking About How We Stand Up and Move. So, Kay, thank you for being here today. Oh, thank, thank you, Greer. <laughs> this is exciting. I, and I love I, I love talking about this stuff. So me too. I can't wait. <laughs> so to okay. start us start us off, you've coined the term vestibular sensing system what is what is that that's a good that's a good first question and I'm going to shut the door because I hear someone coming in okay yeah I'm going to shut the door sorry about that oh, yeah. I I um when I teach uh um when I teach my students I talk a lot about the vestibular system and and originally I would say I would talk about the vestibular system and I what I would say is um, if you've ever even heard the word, what you think about is the ear. And uh, and also, yeah, yeah, in the medical profession, they talk about vestibular and they're always talking e not even about the whole ear, they're talking about a portion of the ear. So then I would say, so when I talk about vestibular, vestibular system, the key word is system. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this, and then I would define it for people. And so when I when I first started working on the book, a friend of mine said, "You can't keep saying that. You can't keep saying, you know, that vestibular, but not what the med how the medical people define it." So that I had to name it, and so I finally named it the vestibular sensing system. But how we stand up is through our senses, and through the vestibular sensing system, which is. So the eyes are probably the most important part of the vestibular system. I'm gonna define the vestibular system now. So the eyes, because we're more visual probably than anything else. And then the second part of the vestibular system is the ears, audio, how we hear. And I don't mean the two parts of the ear, I mean the whole ear through the vibrations of the ear. And the ears and the eyes communicate together through the, op through the optic and audio nerve behind the brainstem. So they're working together. And then what's the largest organ in your body? It's the skin. And so the skin is part of the vestibular sensing system, which means that in our skin, all through our skin, we have uh, uh, sensors. Right now, it's telling you that you're sitting, how you're sitting, it's telling you how comfortable you are, it's telling you whether it's too hot, too cold, if there's some, so it's amazing, we get an amazing amount of information through our skin, but we get the largest amount of information because of the hands and feet having the largest numbers of sensors on them, we get the largest number through the hands and the feet. And the ones on the hands directly connect to the motor cortex of the brain, but the ones on the on the feet uh, directly connect to the visual cortex. So how we, and, and that's also how we refer to proprioception. So when your hands are down, it's uh, for balance and it also gives us information about where we are in space. And so, and the feet directly connect to the visual cortex, which is why we don't have to look down to walk. So then we've got the eyes, we've got the ears, we have the skin, we have the hands and feet, and then the joints. And so the joints are constantly feeding us back information. And in most people, you've cut off some kind of joint. It has stopped registering in the brain. And so that's why we have problems with knees and hips and things like that. And so when you put all those things together, 
that's what gives us our balance and that's what keeps or should give us our balance and keeps us upright. And Alexander had a thing called false sensory awareness and he met sensory. So when one of those, those systems are off, it starts to throw the whole structure off. Even though different parts of the, of the vestibular sensing system actually make up for each other. So, I mean, if you were blind, you could still walk, you could still sit because the ear takes over. And we've and, and if you read a lot of brain technology, you'll see how that works. Did I say too much? <laughs> no, not at all. I think that's great. I think it's a great baseline and gets gets people interested and excited because you just really deep dive into the book and each of these sections, especially bringing in um, some of your other trainings as well, because you specifically did get trained um, in reflexes, the Tomatese method, dark procedures. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking that would be a great way to, um, if you could deep dive a little deeper on what drew you to those things and what they are and why are they are important. Well, well, my vestibular system was off and I had read about um, the Tomatis method, which is a, a retraining for the ear. And I had always wanted to, to do that. And so after I finished my Alexander training, I discovered that in Lafayette, California, there was a Tomatis center. And so, um, and, and it's kind of interesting because I'm usually interested, really interested in knowing how everything works. And when I actually went in to have the, the Tomatis method for myself to get myself straightened out, I really didn't want to know how it worked. I just wanted to go in and do it and get my results and get out. And um, but oh, but the way things worked out is I ended up training in the Tomatis method through Dr. Ron Minson. Uh, who he, he uses the Tomatis method, but it's somewhat different. But he studied with Tomas, uh, Tomatis and, 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 and it's basically the principles and ended up having a listening center in um, Concord, California. So during that time, I learned a lot about how the ear works. And um, I and, I and at the same time, I was doing natural vision education because I had been losing my close vision and I knew I didn't need to do that. And I was looking for a Bates teacher and, and a friend of mine who's an Alexander teacher called me and said, um, there's this Alexander teacher and he's teaching natural vision work and I just want to sign me up. So I was studying the visual work while I was also working with people in an auditory sense. And one of the women who, one of the occupational therapists that was in our group, when she went back to work with her, her young students, uh, children who had um, learning disabilities and uh, other problems, said that the thing that, they, that worked the best was doing the audio, audio with the vision and that we got the best results with these kids. And so I really heard that and started integrating different things. But at the same time, I was studying brain gym. And at the end of the day, this is all brain work. I mean, the senses work through the brain and it's like, so, so, you know, I read as much brain technology as I could. And I have a, I list a couple of like really good books that I think are worth reading if you're interested in brain technology, but if you're interested in the senses and you're interested in the reflexes, you really want to read as much brain technology as you can. And, you know, there've been a lot of new discoveries and one of the, I can't actually remember this, but actually some of it I got from a, a recent book called What Owls Know, because they've been studying owls and how they how they use their senses and their brains. So, but I would rec really recommend that book, What, what Owls Know. And so I just uh, kept working with, um, I started using the natural vision work with the Alexander technique. And then because I had studied um, the reflexes, I started to see how they all integrated together, but it's how we stand up, it's how we move. And you know, when you're looking at children and their first movements, um, what they're doing is they're developing the muscles, yes, especially the flexor muscles, but what they're really doing is developing their vision. So I found that if I took people back through those movements that 
babies and young children go through to develop vision that it, it really worked well with the natural vision work. Now you really, I, I really liked, I think it might be the, the why, your curiosity of the why, but you brought in a lot of books, information, studies to support. And one of the most interesting ones that I thought was when you were, I think it talked about um, the crawling uh, and, yes. and that association with uh, skills and writing. Is that right? Yeah, it, it actually is because a lot of the, the work that I studied through Brain Gym was to help kids who had learning disabilities. And some of it uh, for these kids is eye tracking, mm -hmm. but also um, it's eye tracking and uh, the movement of leading with the head mm -hmm. and um, balancing the audio with the visual and then just like Alexander going forward and up and and a lot of these movements when you have kid when you put a, a child on a balance board and have them bounce balls and eye track them and get the beat of the this is the the ball of Vizex and then you sit them down and have them go back over the same learning they do better they test better Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, it's, yeah. So the balance board would be that they have, there, there's something that they're working on in the background. Mm -hmm. These kids usually need two, two kinds of movements going on at the same time. Then they're bouncing balls to a rhythm and then they're eye tracking why they do it. So you get the eye tracking, you get the sound from the bounce of the ball, the rhythm, and then they're on a balance board and it improves their studies. That's, that's amazing. I know. Really. <laughs> now, and I tell you, I took ball of physics and I really, really enjoyed it. If there's anybody around you who's doing that, give it a try because um, it's just fabulous. I worked with another woman and we we taught it a little bit and, you know, experimentally, really. And so, uh, you know, like neither one of us were going to become ball of physics teachers, but we, we, we experimented with it and uh, got really good results. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. One of my favorite uh, Ida Ralph quotes was um, the strength that you need doesn't come from effort. The strength that you need comes from ease. Yes. Uh, and I found another favorite strength quote uh, in your book. Um, strength is very misunderstood concept. Strength comes not from repetitive movements but from the coordination of the whole structure through the retina with muscles exploding instead of imploding. Yeah, that's a very Alexander idea. It's a very Alexander idea. But, um, and, and um, so uh, hang on. I just, I have a little brain, brain birth there. Um, it's really hard to talk to people about strengths. You know, they want to go out and they want to um, lift weights and things like that. And uh, if you're if you're doing those kinds of exercises, now I'm talking about exercises instead of movements with a failed structure, meaning that you're pulling in on yourself instead of lengthening and widening, um, then ultimately you're hurting yourself. You're not you're not making yourself stronger. It's I've never seen. I've never seen that work, but people really don't want to hear about that. They really don't like that idea. And so I come up against a lot of uh, pushback on that one. And, um, and yet I find that when someone is coordinated, that uh, they move completely different is that that's when they're really strong and you can't push them off their base. It's, and it, not only is it an Alexander idea, but it comes from the martial arts. You know, anybody who really understands the martial arts, not like just people who have taken courses and, and, and teach, but someone who really understands how to teach movement and then takes people into the martial arts. You'll see that they're very um, centered and everything moves. So it's very hard to move them once they've like settled in. And um, actually uh, one of those quotes came from a, a golf book that I read. And um, 
he studied Alexander and then he taught golf and, uh, you know, just bashing away at a ball uh, will get you nothing. Well, sometimes it gets you a little bit, so it's encouraging. <laughs> but when you understand how to coordinate the structure in such a way that you can swing from the whole structure, just like when you watch um, people who, uh, professionals who, who batters, they're, they're using their whole structure in that movement. And it's very different than just swinging off from the arms or shortening and tightening and pulling in. If you look at most of those, um, if you look at the sports section on any of the papers and you look at the pictures that are taken there and you see the kind of extension and lengthening and widening that these people get, but we're talking about someone who's gonna take a ball outside of a stadium. They're gonna hit a ball outside of a stadium you'll see how coordinated they are and that when they hit, when they have good eye-hand coordination and they hit the end of a bat, that they can send a ball all the way. That's strength. Yeah, and so I really try and get people away from, well, what I really try and do is get people to take lessons and understand how to use themselves differently. And then if you want to go do any kind of exercise, it's, it's a very different experience, including yoga, including yoga. <laughs> um, I know. I know. Um, so when you say that it all comes through the retina, like when you were describing it, it it, right. it felt very much like our our session ten of using the whole body in coordination. Whole, yes, yes. But uh in my training at least I don't remember as much of the how the eyes come into play. Uh, and so I'm wondering if you can talk more about them. I can of absolutely the eyes. talk about that. I wished I had started out with it, but you know, it's, it's peripheral vision. And once you lose your peripheral vision, you get your peripheral vision through the retina of the eye. And once you start losing peripheral vision, which means this happens. So when, when you see perif people lose peripheral vision, the head comes forward and they collapse in the front. And then what they're going to try and do is stand up from here when you really have to come up from here and stay in peripheral vision. And then there's a thing called panoramic vision, which gets you up even better, but it's also where our balance comes from. So when you think about Alexander work and natural vision work, you're talking about neck head relationship. And I always thought it was so interesting that Ida Rolf said, you know, the, the, the neck tells the story of the whole man. And so, and she was absolutely right. And and um, I think Alexander teachers, this is a big opinion, so I have to be really careful with this, but you know, I just think they need to go up higher. And the whole third back of the brain is for vision. That's your visual cortex. So if you're not starting from up here, then you've then you're not gonna get what you want below. And the way you have to do that is through the eyes. And so we go into, um, I teach people how to, to, to regain their peripheral vision and how to work the visual pathway. And it excites the visual cortex. And then Alexander said, you have to lengthen and widen the whole back. Well, the whole back isn't here, it starts here. And so if you're not including the visual cortex and peripheral vision and panoramic vision, then you're not gonna get as good a result as, as you could. Is that helpful? Did that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's uh, I think that's fascinating, and I really like to uh, because you've studied so much of early development. Yes, and you even talk about um, developing some of these senses, um, for example, the auditory and the use of the sucking in the mouth, like in utero right. birthing process, and some of those first movements with children and how important that is. Right. Uh, and I was wondering, one, if you could share a little bit more about that, because I found that really interesting. And, and again, you kind of touched on it before, but why you bring that back, some of those first movements with adult clients and why that's right. important. Well, it's interesting because I had a client yesterday and I was interviewing her and I always ask about the birthing process. 
you know, and in utero, um, the baby has all of these movements that it goes through if, if, if things are going well, and they do movements that, that they won't do again until much later, they don't come out, but they rehearse them in the womb. I just, I have a fabulous um, CD of, of that, of them doing things like pincer movements, they open and close the eyes, sometimes they'll suck, uh, they actually suck and will suck the top of the uterus and things like that. And then the birthing process is so important um, to, to development of the structure because they're how they come through the, the, hopefully they come through the vaginal canal and this twisting and turning not only does it release hormones, but it also starts the, the development of, of the muscles and the structure. And uh, nowadays we just, you know, it's they're too, I think they're too quick to like, to do cesareans and it doesn't mean the kids won't catch up it's just it's slower for them yeah healthy kids usually will catch up over time but they're not going to come out with the same um they won't be the same as the kids who come through the birthing canal and have the rotation of the head and so forth when they come out and um so uh and and then the movements that they do early on it's pretty interesting to me um, during the summer, I worked on two people, someone who grew up in Moscow and someone who grew up in China. And th this woman um, who grew up in China has this gorgeous uh, torso. And um, and her fiance, who grew up in Moscow in a very Western uh, situation, the difference was one had baby furniture and one didn't. So the kids who were left on the floor, who are left to their own, and the kids who end up in our style of baby furniture and things like that have have they get a different result by the time that they're adults. It's really interesting to see the torso. Um, you don't see torsos much on Western people. Um, I don't even know how to explain that at the moment. Other than if I had a picture, I could show you the difference. <laughs> and uh, so, so kids, if you infants if you leave them to their own have a whole set of movements that they go through um, there are names for most of these infant reflexes and because we're designed to move in rotation and say so they do it mainly it's rotation but the reason they move is to see more so they're developing their vision they're looking up and they're looking up and then they're looking up down and they're looking up and what are they doing they're developing their close far vision but not only are they developing their close, close far vision, but they're also getting the flexor muscles in the front to develop so that then they can crawl forward. And, and then from the crawling forward, they don't actually stand up, they actually crawl up something and now they're standing. And so, you know, I've had people send me pictures of their children who um, they're having problems in the walking phase. And it's like, Oh my gosh, stop trying to help them. Just leave them alone. Let them be on the floor and let them work that out because they really need to work that out for themselves. And then also get them away from a lot of these jump seats and thing, things like that. Some of it's good. You know, the rocking, the rocking is really important. Um, rotating, all of, you know, that, that kind of thing. And then put them in slings, keep the whole back rounded, you know, these upright. But if I start talking about the things that I see in our culture and baby furniture and shoes like that, I just, we'll just like plan to be here for the rest of the day. <laughs> but, but, but honestly, the easiest thing to do is to like leave, you know, just basically leave them alone and let them work those things out. So again, when I realized that what they were doing was working out their, their vision, Dr. Raymond Dart said, the only reason we ever stood up was to see more. And so that's what they're doing. They're looking and they're trying to find, and they love motion and they love color and they will follow that. And then the body follows, follows what they're seeing, which is interesting. So if I want something that's up there, I'm gonna crawl up there and get it. Next thing you know, they're up. And so that's, that's what's happening through the reflexes. And I found that if I took my visions to, well, I take all of my students, back through some of those early developmental movements. But then I also realize, can see how the whole body is designed to move in rotation. And so it helps people to get back the rotations that they've lost 
in their own structure and anything that what will rotate will go up, right? So here we are, we're going up. And the neck was never, the, I, I probably say this all over the book. I can't stand to read my book anymore because I it took, you know, I had to read it so much when I edited it. But the neck was never designed to turn the head. And I always say that twice with, with all of my, both my students and my clients. And it's from the Atlantic occipital joint through vision. So my eyes go, then my face goes. And then if I don't tighten into this structure, it's just designed to go up, to rotate, to go up. But then that would completely take me up. But if I'm down here trying to do something down here, I'm in trouble. So I get people away from that idea of like thinking about neck and upper back and low back and just thinking about a spine and that if I'm looking, then everything follows and everything goes up. With your, so you have some clients that do Alexander natural vision work uh, some clients that do Heller work, some clients that do both. Uh, what are some of the things that you notice with um, those that do both versus those that yes. just do so one or the I other? I have a guy who I have a, a gentleman who has um, Parkinson's disease, and what he does is he comes for a lesson two weeks in a row, and then he gets body work. Am I curing Parkinson's? No, but he can still move and he stands up beautifully considering the fact that he has Parkinson's. So in an ideal world, people always say, well, if I had unlimited funds and I could do anything I want, how would, like, what would I do? And it's like, you do a lesson a week for two weeks in a row and then you'd have a body work session. But what I really like to do is I really like to have people do the body work, get the series, and then, and then work on lessons to get them moving differently so they don't get back into the situation that they came in. But I think it's really important to free up the fascia layers first and to, to and I've, you know, everything I've read and seen my whole career, Iderolf like really developed the series that I use and I still use it and I still think it's just like brilliant. And so, and getting, getting the length of the muscles going, getting the length the muscles off the bone, getting people ideas already of how to like move and keep what they have um, is my first step. And then I'm always trying to talk people into lessons and I don't, and I don't separate the vision lessons and the, and the, um, and the um, Alexander lessons because the visuals, pathway supports the structure and the structure supports the visual pathway. So if you're going to do natural vision work, we have to really get you moving in such a way that you can use your eyes differently. And if you come in because you have a structural problem and you want lessons, we can't like skip the visual work. I mean, they're in, you can't, they're the same thing. So all of my students get vision work. All of my students get movement work. All of my vision people get movement work. And so, but my my first thing to tell them is like, get a series. If you can get a series, get a series. Unfortunately though, I one of the things that I found is people who love body work don't want to do the movement thing. And people who love the movement thing are like, no, I just, you know, I really like my lessons. I get so much out of them, blah, blah, blah. So, so it's, it's kind of hard, but like in a situation where my, my student has Parkinson's and he's come for a long time and, you know, he really can spend his uh, money on that because there are, you know, having Parkinson's, it limits a lot of, you know, like what he does. So he'd be a good example. And I'll tell you, Parkinson's, Alexander's fabulous for people who have Parkinson's and a lot of those nervous disorder, disorders. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I um, I really, hi girl, <laughs> I schnauzer. <her. laughs> Come on, he can sit there with you. Let's see if we can get her in. Oh, there, well, she's blurred out. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I I really like too that you touched on that I've I've heard um from a couple of different people, but it was it was really well put as kind of the impacts, not just of the baby furniture, but what happens if you put on braces while a child is developing, if you put glasses on somebody while they're developing yeah. and and 
and the impacts that can have if you put a yeah. structure on that either might not be needed or you put a structure on and then you just keep getting better and better prescriptions rather than working yeah. with the structure. Well, so, Well, I wouldn't say better and better prescriptions because what they do is get stronger and stronger. Yeah, and okay. Like, <laughs> and, you're shut, and you're shutting your eyes down more and more and more. And I think children, you know, I think it's really important early on. So I'm not saying all children, okay? There are kids who actually need glasses, but probably very few. And, uh, and actually my vision teacher, Peter Gunvald had like the Coke bottle glasses when he was little and, you know, later on in his life worked, worked his way out of glasses, but, but kids, you really, uh, uh, really want to leave them alone again. And, um, uh, even see, I don't think they should be testing. This is opinion here that they should be testing them so young. And if they don't see well, they should be just moved closer to the blackboard or or whatever. But what kids do need to develop their vision is to rock, rocking, rolling, hopping, skipping, roughhousing, and unstructured uh, play, you know, and getting them out there and, uh, you know, swimming in the ocean, um, um, uh, you know, any kind of unstructured play and give them a chance for the develop for their vision to develop and kids all develop at a different time. And one of the problems with this testing thing is that um, vision is very organic. So what that means is that, you know, if you had a wonderful weekend and everything you did worked right and you got up on Monday morning, your eyes are pretty good. But if you had a terrible week and it's Friday and now you're going to go in and have your eyes tested, you're not going to get the same test that you would if you had gotten up after a wonderful weekend and relaxed and things just went your way because it's very organic. So it would depend on what time of day you were tested. It's like the testing is not everything. And so, you know, I encourage people who call me about their kids and, and I'll tell you who calls me about their kids. It's not Americans. It's usually people from other countries who use more natural medicine. And like even the American guy that who called me about his daughter because she was up on her toes. I mean, he grew up in Mexico City. Um, we tend to use more allopathic medicine and you know, we tr we trust that kind of stuff. Um but when they call me, it's like, I usually say, just give them a chance, you know, take the glasses off and give them a chance. But I guess my biggest thing is the sunglasses thing, especially for kids, because you don't want to shut the retina down and that's what it does. And then you need darker and darker and darker glasses. And you really want the eye to function the way it's designed. Um, but for kids, give, you know, later on, Later on, they can, and, and, and the sad thing about it is this is a billion dollar business, this glass glasses business. And uh, for adults, as far as like natural vision and stuff, I think that, um, that you have to be interested in learning something and learning how to reuse your visual pathway and reuse your visual cortex. For kids, you let them go, go out and play and walk and put them in a swing, swing them. Swinging is fabulous. You know, I was trying to think of all the things that you could do, but just, you know, some woman called me and she wanted to bring her child in. I said, my God's sake, just get them to a playground. You know, get them on a swing, get them going down the slide, get them rolling around. And we nowadays, when I see these playgrounds for kids, they're really creative. And it's very, it's very different than what we just had the swing set in the slide. They have things like nets that they can climb in and tunnels. And that's the kind of stuff they need. And then, and then much later on, you can, you can, you know, if they still need some help, um, glasses. That's what I want. We're lucky we have them, but they're not, we're not using them the way they're designed. That's what I want for my doctor practitioner to say, I need some help. Go play on a playground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go get the okay. swing. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just looking at my questions because we've had fun talking, but I wanted to make sure. Um, so I did want to expand a little because when I read this and we touched on it before, but what is brain gym? 
Brain gym. Oh gosh. Okay. That's, that's a really good question. You can look it up online and you will find brain gym and brain gym practitioners. Um, I think my favorite practitioner is Dr. Carla Hannaford and uh, they work with kids who have learning disabilities and they do it through movement. They do it through visual movement too. And they're very much interested in the audio. So they're, you know, you'll find information about tomatoes and, um, uh, uh, mm, uh, I'm trying to think of the other start procedures. No, no, but that's <laughs> but that's okay. But but go out, go and look it up. And basically, you know, they can work one on one with kids. And it's I think it started from pattern. Well, patterning is one of the things. You know, back in the '80s, I would hear about you know patterning for kids and. Um, and what they do is they take them physically one-on-one -on -one through certain movements to help them uh, uh, for learning disabilities, I think generally is what it is. And Dr. Cal uh, Carla Hannaford wrote a book about um, uh, dominant dominant eye, dominant ear, dominant foot, dominant, and she studied uh, brain dominance. And so they would test these kids, this is a brain gym thing, they would test these kids for different dominance. And according to that dominance, that's how they would teach them. That's how they would put them in a room in a school, you know, so if you're, you know, and then so, so brain gym, they used, um, they use testing the muscle testing. I'm trying to think of all the elements of it. But you know, it's just so inclusive that it's it's hard to describe brain gym other than that they really understand the senses and how it wakes up the brain and how it helps these kids who who have ADD and auditory processing problems and things like that. But then you can also use it for, you know, for kids who have nervous disorders. And and that's actually Dr. Raymond Dart, who, who used, he was an anthropologist and a doctor and a bunch of other things that I can't even list here. But he had a son who was brain damaged. And uh, because he understood early developmental movement, he started using that to help his brain damaged son and then develop took those movements, which, you know, he didn't develop those. Those are, you know, early developmental movements, but put them into a series um, called the DART procedures. And you can look up DART procedures too. But brain gym is very encompassing in a lot of different areas. Um, but if you read Dr. Carla Hannaford's work, The Child, uh, Awakening the Child's Heart, or any of their literature, you know, you'd be really um, impressed. And that's, and that's how I hooked up with um, the neurokinesiology, because she's a Russian teacher who worked with brain gym and, you know, for kids who have uh, palsy. Uh, and so anyhow, and, but at the end of the day, we're working with the nervous system and fight or flight, almost all of these things are that you're locked into a fight or flight through some kind of trauma. That That's what made me think of that. My Russian teacher used to work with um, big accidents in Russia, like one of the, the big train accidents and would help people who had been traumatized because you're stuck into a fight or flight and help them come out of that and then extended it into other kinds of works. I think she was at Chernobyl too. And um, I have her book listed in my in my book. Yeah, I really liked how you talked about, especially like the like the clenching of the jaw or the clenching of the fist. And oh, it just started to put a lot together as forms of like, well, what's like shortening and tightening and what state of being is the nervous system in versus when you talk right. a lot like of lengthening and opening. Um right. And, and you effect. can't be in a you can't be in a fight or flight and you know and and allow the muscles to lengthen and widen um, because that's actually what fight I wrote I wrote a paper years ago it might still be on my on my website I don't look at my website very often but it's the physiological effects of trauma and in the physiological effects of trauma you know the eyes change how we hear changes we usually change ear dominance. Um, the muscles shorten and tighten. A lot of that low back stuff is just um, uh, is uh, fetal for protection. And uh, so basically at the end of the day, I'm always working with the nervous system and I'm always 
helping people to calm down and come out of fight or flight, and then how to stay out of fight or flight. Um, this is just something I'm really curious about, but okay. <laughs> when you're, when you're working, I know we have so much, you have so much training and so much background mm -hmm. when you're working with somebody, either hands on or, um, hands off, what, what are you listening to? What is important for you to tune into, um, what are the things that show up? Like, what is the, what is the silent dialogue that's going on for you as a practitioner? Well, because I'm trained as an Alexander teacher from the time I see someone, I can, I'm, al I'm already looking at the structure and understanding what's going wrong. But then when I get somebody on a table and I'm putting my hands on certain areas, I can feel where it's uh, gotten, that it's, I can see where it's tight and short. I mean, I visually can see where a body's tight and short. And then I confirm it by getting my hands in there when I'm doing a hello work session and see, yeah, it's all stuck here. And, um, and my job again, but the difference probably between uh, uh, Alex, uh, hello workers who are trained and don't have the Alexander aspect is that I'm I'm always doing what uh, what we call in Alexander the directions, so it's very specific directions, and then I added the the um, the um, uh, rotations to to that material, and I'm always take try, trying to take an area in back into its more normal position, and then seeing what happens. And on someone like I work on someone who's in his nineties. And I, and I actually don't take his leg back into position because it's been there for 90 years or something like that. But I do the best I can to get that lengthened out, regardless of the fact that this is this thing has pretty much calcified into his body and uh, and then give him ideas about how to use himself better. Um, but I'm always tracking. You know, I don't, I don't know how to not track anymore. I'm tracking everything. <laughs> and I have, I have someone coming in today and because all of the, the, the because she's in her eighties and she's got a bad back and she wants some lessons, I'm going to do very little. I'm going to do, I'm going to just do very little with her. Because if I can, because if I can get one idea across, and it improves something, she'll stick with it. If she finds one thing there, and the best thing I can do is to like back off, because I see everything. It's like, oh, let's let's fix it. Let's fix all this, right? And just back off and try and give her one or two things that help her in the moment, and then she'll come back and and do more. I it's love hard. that. It's hard to back. It's hard to back up. Back up. Do you find that brings a lot more empowerment to your clients? Yeah, it, it's much better. It really is because you know you well. You know, someone walks into your office and you're looking at this. And it's like, okay, I got to fix this. I got to fix that. It's like, oh my gosh, you know. And it's like, no, 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 no. I mean, actually, you know, in a first couple lessons or a first couple sessions, it's like let's find out if we like each other because things go better. <laughs> when we like each other yeah 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 and you know and that in and of itself brings people back if you know if they like you then they're like okay well she's she seems to know something let's try this <laughs> there might be trust involved <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so the last thing I wanted to touch on, just because uh I think it's a, an interesting part is that toward the end of your book you give a lot of kind of uh, things to consider or how exercises to do. And a big one is laying on the ground. Okay, uh, on a chair. Or yeah. Something for the skull. I, you know, I, I, I went back and forth about writing remedies. Yeah. You know, because remedies will work for a while, but they're not, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to completely do it. I mean, you know, it's like if you're headed for trouble, remedies are like help you 
stay functional in the moment. And then I thought, well, what about someone who lives lives somewhere that there's absolutely no Alexander teacher or there's no Heller workers or they just are never going to have the money to come in and like do something like that. So let's throw out the remedies, you know, the things that you can do for yourself right now. And if you do them on a regular basis and you follow those things that you can help yourself a lot. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I put the remedies in there. But I but I didn't make anything like, oh, and this this is all you need to do. Cause that's generally, you know, what happens. You tell somebody, well, you know, those shoes that you have in your feet aren't working for you. And like, and they change it and it works and they think, oh, well, that's the magic bullet. And it's not, we know it's not the magic bullet, that it takes a whole lot more than that. But again, I wrote it for people who who are never gonna never going to be able to like have contact with a body worker something like that well, I think that's great um, and I like it for me as a body worker it's been very <laughs> inspiring okay. for yeah. me to learn more about the especially the senses and the impacts mm-hmm. on the structure and kind yeah. of putting all of those pieces together so I think this is a, a lovely place to to end so I want to to thank you so much I so appreciate uh your beautiful melting pot of knowledge and how you put it together in your book and to let people know just to check out your website uh it is right I will get it up it's written it's ready to go (laughs) I'll get it published and I will but I will get something up on the website so that people can get the book and 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 have it wonderful Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Greer. Thank you.